Hey, very good morning to us all. Um, our team, our dear partners who are present with us here today, this is the Kingdom of Africa, we have FIDA Uganda, um, we have uh, Rahu in the house, and um, we have staff from Centre for Health, Human Rights and Development, and uh, Afya Nahaki, where the press conference is happening live right now. Um, we'd like to welcome you all to this Women's Health Matters press conference. And um, this is being uh, um, convened in commemoration of the International Day of Action for Women's Health. Uh, specifically, it was international, but now we are bringing this live to you from the Ugandan context. And uh, we want to bring close to you the issues that are at our hearts in terms of women's health. Uh, we all know that um, central to, to, to the country is um, the welfare of what we call a woman. Um, we all know that uh, women solely bear the maternal um, health functions um, of this country and as such they are supported by a whole lot of a system and uh, some of these systems oftentimes have actually failed us and as partners at the national level, um, also representing our partners at the grassroots, we are ensuring that we bring to the forefront some of these issues that uh, we've come up with um, informed by the work that we have seen over the past years, where we've seen persistent issues that have kept coming up. And um, as such, today, as we put ourselves here together in different voices, in different capacities, this is the opportunity we're going to be using to speak to you, the audience out there that are following us live on Facebook, of what our findings have been throughout the course of our uh, advocacy works within the country on the health rights um, of women in Uganda. And we are going to be having um, a press statement that will speak to the different issues, specifically what is on ground, what women face um, in terms of um, trying to ensure that they enjoy their right to health, um, the different calls to action for the different stakeholders. Um, even as civil society right now, as we come before you, we are playing our role in terms of bringing these issues before you, in terms of holding ourselves um, as transparent as we can be and uh, appreciating where we've made headways or some milestones and where we feel there have been gaps. Um, these are clearly going to be highlighted in, in our statement today. But most importantly, accountability, holding ourselves accountable to the numerous health violations that uh, women continue to face by virtue of being um, female by sex. So we shall go into our press statement, which we are going to read live. And uh, my dear colleagues seated next to me will be um, delving into that in just a few minutes. And um, with that, I thank you all, and I hope that you can follow us throughout um, the few hours that we shall be with you. And we look forward to your participation in the chats, um, on Facebook, sending your messages as um, these messages are read out, so that we have collaborative or joint voicing in order to call um, to action to, to the government, um, to the different stakeholders um, that we continue to work with, the different line ministries of health, education, um, gender, justice law actors, uh, members of parliament, and the different like-minded civil society organizations who have continued to journey with us and work with us in ensuring that uh, women realize their full potential by their right to health being um, jealously guarded and our government being intentional in ensuring that every woman, every girl um, reaches their full potential to ensure that um, they are not looked at from a point of um, secondary citizen, but as a citizen in their own right in this country. I thank you, and I'll pass the mic over to my colleague, Anne. Um, thank you again for joining us in this uh, press statement and the conversation. I will read this statement, which is uh, for immediate release on this day, uh, the Friday, June 10th um, of uh, 2022. In, and this statement is being read in commemoration of the International Day of Action for Women's Health. Today, as civil society organizations uh, in Uganda, we are being convened here by CEHAT, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, 
to join the world as we commemorate the International Day of Action for Women's Health, which is marked every 28th of May, to foster the sexual reproductive health rights of women around the world and draw attention to the deepest form of disregard of, of um, autonomy, coercion, discrimination, violence, as it's, it is experienced by many women and girls in our societies today. And remind, uh, this is also to remind key actors about the multiple health-related issues that affect women. Earlier this week, we unveiled a campaign uh, together with other civil society organizations, uh, which was themed Women's Health Matter, through which we are leading a conversation on ways through uh, which the existing gender health inequalities that women and girls experience in our country can be redressed. It is important to note that the realization of women's rights to health is a driver of the sustainable development goals, and women's health is critical. It's a critical pathway to realizing gender equality and the empowerment. One of the issues that our country faces is the challenges of maternal health that statistics uh, indicates a high ratio of maternal mortality, despite uh, it being has, uh, having reduced, it remains unacceptably high. And at the moment, it is uh, 336 women per 1,000 live births. So uh, according to the UDHS of uh, 2016, and this, in essence, translates in losing 16 women every day. That's a full taxi of women plus the driver and the conductor dying every day. And uh, maternal, and these are a result of maternal health complications, which are preventable. The, some of the, the issues that contribute to this rate is the unsafe abortion that uh, uh, contribute to the morbidity and mortality. And other causes like postpartum bleeding, obstructed labor, inf inf infection related to childbirth, that's uh, sepsis, pregnancy-induced high blood pressure, uh, that's eclampsia, or preeclampsia, and other related complications. Unfortunately, as a country, adolescent female account for a significant proportion of the maternal deaths which are largely due to preventable causes like malnutrition, infections, hemorrhage, coupled with inadequate health care and supportive services and information, particularly in rural areas. Furthermore, you, uh, as a country, we retain a high burden of sexual reproductive health risks among young people, such as teenage pregnancies, which you have seen uh, uh, increased in the last two years uh, of the pandemic. And also there's gender-based violence there are STD, uh, STIs, children, uh, child marriages, HIV, and harmful practices like female genital mutilation. And nearly one quarter of Uganda's population is between the age of 10 to 19. Many of these young people are at a risk of already struggling, uh, or are already struggling with consequences of unplanned pregnancies or sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV and AIDS. In, indeed, uh, about an estimated 67 new young Ugandans get infected with HIV every day. And this represents 44% of all new infections in the country, the majority of which are sexually transmitted. Um, young women in particular are at a significant risk for both unintended pregnancies and HIV infection. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic um, increased so a number of uh, gender-based violence cases going up, the rates of teenage pregnancies also going up, and also early marriages um, that all increased during these uh, past two years. Women and girls and young girls were confined to their homes during the lockdown, and they increasingly uh, experienced violence. Um, in their homes. The measures to respond to COVID-19 further exacerbated the risk factors for vulnerable populations such as women as they were locked uh, in their homes with their abusers 
and isolated uh, from help that they needed. At least 644,955 teenage pregnancies were recorded during the COVID-19 lockdown in Uganda, uh, uh, and that's according to the United Nations Population Fund. Since March 2020, when COVID-19 hit the world, an estimated 354,736 teenage pregnancies were reported following the closure of all schools in the country for at least eight months. And an additional 290,219 pregnancies were reported between January and September of 2021. These numbers of recorded pregnancies is five times higher than the number of cumulative COVID-19 positive cases that have been reported since 2020. As Uganda, we have ratified major international human rights instruments on health, including sexual reproductive health uh, rights and women's health, giving the country an obligation to protect the rights that the various treaties, declaration, covenants, and protocols are defined. Now we're going, um, now we're going to talk about what we're asking for from the government and all critical stakeholders, because we believe these important steps should be taken to ensure that women and girls, and we mean all women and girls in their diversity, to enjoy their rights to health fully without stigma or judgment. We want to see this concrete action taken by the government to ensure that all women and girls in their diversity can enjoy their right to health. And this should be felt in the health programming, financing, and decision making. It is quite critical to fund the health sector with our taxes. We know that in the last five years, the highest percentage of allocation to health was 7%. We need more than that. The Abuja Declaration states that all countries which they agreed to would fund at 15%, and we're not seeing that yet. And so we need a commitment to that from the government. We also have to ensure that the healthcare system is meeting the needs of all women and girls as it should be. As a country, we have to aim higher and do better in ensuring that we don't lose any more women and girls to preventable causes, as has been mentioned by my colleague, in terms of maternal mortality, unsafe abortion, gender-based violence, and other things. And so, action must be taken to fulfillment of the right of women and girls to health. So how about we take a stand to improve the efficiency of healthcare delivery and access systems for all women and girls, and ensure to take a gender-sensitive approach to addressing the medical, social, cultural, and economic factors that adversely affect women and girls' health and limit their health spans. We want to see improved access to information and services, especially for sexual and reproductive health and rights. We also believe that the government has the power to invest and create ways to improve women's and girls' health. So more than anything else, we're asking again that we need sufficient funds in the national budget for maternal health care, but for comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services. Thank you. We ask everybody to play their role from civil society organizations. We've done this through creation of evidence, um, but also making sure that we contribute to the development of policies where government has collaborated with us. In addition to that, we have held government accountable through strategic uh, litigation. And with this has yielded positive results. A case in point being the uh, petition 16. Uh, in this uh, petition 16 case, we, uh, the, constitution, we, the court agrees with us and uh, const emphasizes the constitutional right of women of Uganda to perform and fulfill their natural maternal function. At uh, this, um, we appreciate the government for the steps they've taken in realization and implementation of this uh, judg judgment through the maternal health audit, but unfortunately women are still dying due to preventable causes women are still dying due to things like blood which the population freely donates critical to that is also um, calling government to heed and all stakeholders the implementation of the comprehensive sexuality education uh, uh, court ruling uh, that uh, a positive ruling that comes in after five years of say had battling with the government of uganda in court uh, that yields a positive ruling 
With this, the court, is, uh, the, uh, court tasks uh, the Ministry of Health, of Education and Sports to develop a policy on comprehensive sexuality education within two years. With this, um, we know that for sure, access to information, which is cannot be grant, uh, granted through our availing uh, sexuality education, cannot be, can uh, be a contribution and it will go a long way in improving the sexual productive health and rights outcomes to realistically look at the, meet the challenges that young people face. As we continue to have contestations of sexuality education in Uganda, we still risk our young people uh, to live without critical sexual productive health and rights information. This is uh, not only causing to their death, but it is also exposing them to teenage pregnancies, um, to teenage pregnancies, it is causing them uh, to drop out of school because they are pregnant. It's, uh, it's causing them to uh, get exposed to HIV. And of course, this one has an implication on the country's aspirations, like the Vision 2040, but also an aspiration to, read, uh, to reach a middle income status. Definitely, this is not happening if nearly uh, half of them are adolescents who are the tomorrow's future, or today's future, if we must say, are dropping out of school without an education to enable them to favorably compete in the job market. We also, court, court uh, makes an emphasis that the term comprehensive that has been a point of contestation through various stakeholders is a matter of, it's just a semantic. Do we want to look at an adolescent holistically? And that is what comprehensiveness is meaning in this case. We, uh, the inclusion or the exclusion of the term comprehensive is simply a matter of or, or a form that should never derail the process of making sure that young people have access to information uh, on their sexual productive health and rights, which definitely is the right to them, but also making sure that they fulfill uh, their right to education uh, without us standing in their way uh, by fronting the moral uh, and religious sentiment of cards. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Henry Tumesija from FEDA Uganda. Uh, here are the actions that we are advocating for uh, towards realizing an end to gender-based uh, violence. Uh, we are advocating for the creation of safe uh, listening space for women, support initiatives that target to eliminate gender-based violence scourge in our communities, openly condemn harmful practices and negative social norms. Uh, there we have uh, an example of female genital uh, mutilation, FGM. Uh, scale up evidence-based community violence prevention approaches that address GPV and violence against women and girls. Scale up uh, the prevention efforts that address an equal gender power relations as a root cause of gender-based violence. Focus prevention efforts on changing social norms that underpin violence against women. Strengthen and enhance multi-sector services. Develop support programs for, professional, for professionals experiencing second-hand trauma. Bolster the case uh, eight months. Uh, an additional, an additional 290,000 219 pregnancies were reported between January and September 2021. Uh, the number of recorded pregnancies in the number of recorded pregnancies is five times higher than the number of cumulative COVID-19 cases that have been reported, and this is uh, also a challenge in in this era, especially as a result of COVID-19. Uh, 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 scratch that we have been uh, experiencing. Uh, child protection actors through systematic training and membership, improve facilities and logistical support for, of course, for women and, and girls, and strengthen coordination and referral mechanisms, including local leaders and refugee welfare committees. Then, uh, Lastly, establish community-based protection structures that work as information conduits. Thank you.
as we've all heard, um, there are quite so many issues that are still disturbing. And um, from the statement, we clearly see that we know where we want to head to. But most importantly, we also know that we have um, our taxes that should be well accounted for as a nation. And we as civil society organizations taking part in this process today are saying that uh, we need our taxes to be used to fund the health sector. This has been a call that has come in, year in, year out. We know that um, the, the budgetary allocation to the domestic funding in health is always in IC, ICU. It's always in intensive care. You know, health and um, human resource um, go hand in hand. If you have a healthy nation, then you have a productive economy. So we're calling uh, upon government to ensure that our taxes are properly utilized to ensure that um, uh, women and girls of this country receive their maternal health care services in a comprehensive uh, manner, but most importantly, using a gender lens while we budget for our health systems in, in, in this country. Uh, we also really want to call upon um, our nation to ensure that uh, women access the right sexual reproductive health rights information through comprehensive packaging um, of this information to ensure that um, girls and women and the support system around them, even the men, are able to make informed decisions or choices that pertain their well-being. Oftentimes, we have been choosy as a country and we have always used the ticket of values-based uh, approach in, in realizing justice for all. But we also need to be questioning because the world is not static. It's always evolving and the emerging trends all over the globe, and if we are working towards being part of the global village, we need to be alive to these changes, and uh, we cannot keep hiding our heads in the sun and saying that we are values-based at the cost of certain human rights of a particular section of this country. And when we're talking about women and girls, we're looking at women and girls in their full diversities, every sense of the word of um, diversity to ensure a meaningful participation and inclusion. Um, yeah, our audience out there and our partners, I think um, this statement has been comprehensive and it's given us what the problem is, the calls to action in terms of what can be done, but most importantly, it's highlighted for us the issues that women keep struggling with when it comes to um, realizing their full maternal functions as a nation or as part of this nation. And with that, uh, we are beautifully uh, clouded in these t-shirts and um, our audience, these t-shirts have different messages and most of them have different calls to action, but we also have different voices at the back, as you can see, there are messages on placades, but also would like to take this opportunity to call on the different uh, members of um, this convening today to boldly add their voice, not just to the placards and the messages in the t-shirts, but for you to actually hear from them what they would like to see different when it comes to safeguarding the right to health for women and girls um, in our country. So the mic is free. Whoever has a very burning and beautiful call to action, feel free to take it on. Anybody? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my call uh, to action is in regard to SGBV prevention and response. We call upon the government of Uganda to ensure that uh, sexual reproductive health rights and sexual gender-based violence is integrated in all health facilities. In terms of providing psychosocial support to these survivors, in terms of availing the necessary commodities, like for example emergency con contraceptives, to ensure that all health service providers are trained on how to manage and handle SGBV. And further call to action is to ensure that Minister of Health disseminates the directive that pre prevents health service providers from extorting money from survivors of sexual gender-based violence. Because through that, many people are sit home and their right to justice, access to justice is denied. So that's my call to action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. Any other? Good morning, everyone. My call to action and voice is goes to the health workers, the midwives. They were recently on strike, and the issue is they are not being paid enough. 
they're not facilitated. So we need the government. and the health workers are not motivated you know they are not even receptive to them and that's one of the leading causes because you get to hospital there's no one to attend to you and you die and that has to stop thank you so much thank you my call to action is uh, government to provide facilities in hospitals most of the death that we are seeing it's because some of the facilities some of the uh, of the things that are supposed to be used when um, mothers are giving birth are not available there are no gloves the mama kits are few for some health facilities they, they are not even there so my call to action to the government is to provide facilities in these hospitals, in these health centers, such that we see our mothers give birth safely and go back home with their babies. It hurts to go home, to go to hospital when you're well and you lose a baby just because there were no gloves, just because there was no blood. It is so hurting. We've seen lots of death. Families are suffering and it's not something that would, no one wishes to be in such a position. My call, uh, my call to action is to the men. Um, we usually leave the responsibility of women's health, women's menstruation, and women's rights to the women. But these men are the ones that are making these women pregnant, and these men have daughters. So all these issues that affect women are affecting the men indirectly. So they need to join us in this fight. That's my call to action. you all. My call to action is uh, for government and parliament to be intentional about reducing maternal mortality and morbidity due to unsafe abortion. My colleague gave statistics, staggering statistics of women who died due to unsafe abortion. Our constitution provides under Article 22.2 that no person has a right to terminate the life of an unborn except authorized by law. But we do not have such a law. We have left women to do it the unsafe way. Parliament has a duty under Article 79 to legislate. They have not legislated. The Ministry of Health is very much aware of these statistics. They passed guidelines to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity due to unsafe abortion. But these guidelines have since been stopped they have been recalled they have been stayed we don't know for what reason but even then the guidelines don't have a force of law our constitution gives us that leeway and we call upon parliament to exercise to 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 operationalize that article and uh, stop women from doing it the wrong way so in the recent months from january to May, say had received a number of maternal deaths because the health workers were requesting money from the teenage pregnant mothers, which they did not have. This call is for all health workers in the country to do the ethical work and not request, especially in government hospitals, the parents, the mothers who have come for delivery, especially when they need emergency obstetric care. So this will help us reduce the numbers. When a mother dies because they cannot afford 30,000, they cannot afford 50,000, we lose a mother, we lose a child. This has to stop today. Thank you. My call to action for government is uh, around HIV and maternal health. Um, we need to make sure that the health facilities are safer for our women. If they are not, then women will continue going to TBAs where they continue to contract HIV or transmit HIV to the young and born children. And that increases the cases of HIV among the young children, which shouldn't be happening. Children should be born when they are free and they can live in two useful adults. So we need to support the health system to be safer for our mothers so that they can easily access the services and we all be safe.
Thank you. I want to talk about inclusivity in the, de in the delivery of health services uh, to women, uh, especially when you go to these labor wards or delivery rooms. We actually need their specialized beds for women with disabilities, uh, not these normal beds for normal women who don't have any of those disabilities. It's a very big issue and we see them, uh, they are left to deliver from the floor because they, their uh, physical uh, appearance cannot match with the beds, delivery beds uh, that we currently have in our own hospitals. So I call upon the government to also think about the same so that uh, women with disabilities can also find comfort when they are giving birth. Thank you. I also want to add a voice to the asks that we are uh, putting forward. In particular, we have heard from the leading causes of maternal health as hemorrhage, which means uh, bleeding, over bleeding, and that requires that blood is there. When women are going to these facilities, they need to find blood in those facilities in the event that they overbleed and they need uh, to get blood. We've seen a story just uh, about two days ago of uh, a, a woman who died uh, in a health facility while giving birth because there was no blood in the, in the hospital. So the relevant stakeholders, the Uganda Blood Transfusion Services, the parliament that allocates uh, to the budget for the Uganda Blood Transfusion Services, the Ministry of Health that uh, which the, uh, plays the overall, site, uh, overall uh, oversight over the, the agencies to ensure that there's blood um, in those health facilities but also to the public it's a call to us to donate uh, next week on 14th is a world blood donor day so to call to us as the public to come forth and donate because blood cannot be manufactured but it has to be given voluntarily by all of us in support of the women uh, and the girls and our mothers who are giving birth thank you well, when talking about uh, maternal health commodities beyond the mamba kids, I think blood should be central in everything and how it's stored and how it's accessed is supposed to be made public information because every single day I'm sure whether reported or unreported we can relate to somebody we know that has lost a loved one due to um, an availability of blood coming in much later when a life has been lost. Um, so um, I think with that personally, I've been reflecting in terms of the high rates of defilement cases in this country that have still left so many uh, young girls and families stranded. My call to action is in whatever state that we live in, can we make the environment, especially the learning environments, as friendly as possible for these young learners who are probably expectant or pregnant, um, probably have already given birth. Let's not stigmatize them. Let's give them a second chance within the school learning environment and make sure that you know we support them to become independent uh, persons of this community rather than um, castigate them. And then, of course, finally, I've been reflecting too um, in terms of the justice, the tail end of justice uh, for our learners, or even women and girls out there. As a country, we need to be intentional in ensuring that we establish a specialized court that is fully mandated to handle cases that relate to sexual offenses of, of violence in the most um, speedy manner as possible. Most of these cases are very traumatizing cases, um, people. When you demand for this evidence to be kept in whatever manner, this is like defiling this person a second time or raping a person the second time. Can our justice system wake up to ensure that our women are encouraged, your girls are supported to ensure that they follow the chain of justice till the very end to bring the perpetrators um, to book. This has affected me women's mental health and the families around the supportive system to a point that um, a lot have lost hope and have just given up in life. And all this is because most times the narrative focuses on the woman or the girl who has been sinned against, not one twice, um, rather than the perpetrators. So I call upon us to ensure that uh, whatever we do, let's think about the entail of justice to encourage people to come out there and speak about the violences against them in a manner that does not stick, but rather 
supports. I don't know if there are any additional issues coming up for now, but I would like to thank all our partners. We have members of the media here. We have our influencers in the house. And uh, some of us have added voices to it. We have members of staff here from different organizations um, that have taken their time to pour out their hearts into issues that are affecting women's um, health or issues that are harboring the realization of um, women's health um, comprehensively. Because I think health is beyond just the physical, but mental holistically. So we thank you all for listening in and uh, participating. Participating, sorry. Drop in your comments uh, for whatever you want to see better in terms of helping government and uh, supportive partners achieve better health for women. We thank you so much, and uh, we wish you a, a good afternoon. The cause continues. Men's health matters. Women's health matters. Uh, this week, the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, CEHAT, are uh, joining the rest of the world to commemorate the International Day uh, of Action for Women's Health. And uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, women's health matters and it matters all the time and every time uh, because uh, there is no country that can realize its development goals without taking care of the health of the women and girls. Uh, here in Uganda, we have uh, made a lot of progress in different uh, aspects of women's health. Uh, we have uh, managed to, to bring down um, maternal uh, mortality in the last many years, but uh, within the region, the African region and Eastern African region, our maternal mortality ratio is still high. It is at 336 uh, per 100,000 women. That is still very high. And also we need to take note that uh, the, uh, among the top five causes for maternal mortality in our country, one of them is definitely hemorrhage. That's bleeding after childbirth. And we know that oh, often we have the blood crisis in the country, we need to be addressing that. Uh, uh, we also uh, need to note that preventable causes such as hypertension during pregnancy is also among the top causes of maternal mortality. And so we need to step up our efforts on awareness creation and in, uh, uh, encouraging women, especially those in the rural, uh, rural areas, to attend antenatal clinics to ensure that uh, such preventable causes for maternal mortality are detected early and treated. Uh, we also know that uh, infections are among the causes, but most importantly also we, we lose many women, especially young women, to unsafe abortions in the country. And we know that we have restrictive laws on, our, on abortion and we need to be thinking as a country how we can address the problem of unsafe abortions because we, we continue to see young women die of it. Uh, at the other key uh, health issue uh, facing women in this country, is gender-based violence and uh, more specifically sexual gender-based violence that it does not only cause physical harm it only causes psychological spiritual and trauma to the women and we don't have strong psychosocial sub support services that uh, are uh, established to support women that have been traumatized or have suffered gender-based violence uh, also, the, the, the other problems, uh, health problems for women in this country is the issue of the health of refugee women. Uganda has one of the highest refugee uh, uh, population uh, within the East African region. But I want to note that 82% of refugees are actually women and children and they have very unique health challenges, uh, including the difficult for them to access health services and we need to pay attention to, to that. So uh, um, I want to also note that as we focus on addressing uh, issues of women's health, it is extremely important for us to address the social determinants of health that we know very well, the issue of education. Uh, we need to ensure that girls and women continue to uh, get education and we know it's a challenge for the country due to teenage pregnancies. It should be our priority to ensure that girls get education. We know that uh, issues of water and sanitation are important for women's health, and meaning that we really have to ensure that uh, there is uh, access to safe water for, for girls and women. Uh, we also know uh, that uh, um, um, issues of uh, 
education, water and sanitation, um, housing, income status are all uh, social determinants of health that impact on the health of women. So uh, again, uh, uh, as part of the commemoration of this week, uh, for us to take action on women's health, I want to call upon our government, development partners, civil society organizations, and also private sector to give, to give much more attention to the health of girls and women in this country uh, by removing the barriers to, uh, to, uh, to their realization of their uh, health and, and, and well-being. The number one is to ensure that we allocate uh, enough funds to address all the issues that I've mentioned. Number two, we need to pay attention to the infra health infrastructure. The health facilities need to be equipped, the healthcare workers need to be skilled, and so on. Uh, number three, uh, we need to strengthen psychosocial support services within our health system to be able to address those, those, those the non-medical health issues that women are facing.